not much to finish up with interpolation. Um, if you remember, last time we, we actually before, before you remember that, for Thursday, if weather is still going to be problematic and it's not going to allow you to come here, um, so we will figure another plan for exam one. We'll either postpone it or um, figure out a way to do it online, okay? But be ready to take exam one on Thursday as planned, okay? Do not rely on the clouds that they're going to push the exam away. So plan on Thursday, exam one, okay? All right, so um, open up your uh, interp activity one notebook that we were working with last time. If you recall, we were doing a full polynomial interpolant with all the data points for the density and the temperature, right? So we had that 19, the 18 degree polynomial. It was a huge um, polynomial, very high order polynomial. And we did the polyfit with the polynomial directly. So go ahead and open up that notebook. Um, I'm gonna open, up, open it up on my end too. And sorry about this uh, projector, seems that they can't figure out how to get it working, but someone must have changed the settings on it. It's a little cropped up and fuzzy. Uh, okay. So if you recall, that was the data set we were working with, uh, density versus temperature. Okay. We did linear interpolation and a bunch of other things. And then we went all the way down to reverse interpolation. We learned how to sort the array and all of that. And then the last one was polynomial interpolation. And most of you had, all of you, I hope, had this warning, polyfit may be poorly conditioned. And I'm glad that you got that message because remember the uh, polynomial order in this case, we have 19 data points. The full polynomial is going to be of order number of data points minus one, which is 18. So that's a polynomial of order 18. We will understand what this message means in a minute. Um, but it's good that you have received this message. And then I asked the question last time, what is stored in coefficients? Um, remember, we are trying to fit a, po a polynomial of the form A0 plus A1x, plus A2x squared, plus A3x cubed, and so on. And we're looking to find those coefficients, A0, A1, A2, A3. So once we pass that polynomial, once we weave it through each and every data point, we have one equation per data point. Okay? And then we solve, we have then in the end, a linear system of equations for the unknown coefficients. We solve that. That's what polyfit returns to us, okay? And the coefficients are sorted in reverse order. So this would be A18 and this would be A0, okay? Now, to evaluate with polyfit, it's interesting, unlike um, in TERP, you have to do it in two steps. You first do the polyfit to find the coefficients, and then you take the coefficients and you pass them in a function called polyval to Take those coefficients, apply them to a standard polynomial, and give you a value. And the way this works, you, in the first argument of polyval, you pass the coefficients. Those could be two or three or ten coefficients. Polyval figures out the order automatically. And then you pass it a bunch of values for where you want to um, evaluate the, the, um, the density. So here we're saying we want to evaluate the density at 412 and 415. And you just simply pass that, and you get... 0 0.84, um, this is nothing, nothing fancy over here, okay? Um, the next question is evaluate the density at 980 kelvins. So go ahead and try to do that with Python. Again, call, right now you solve for the coefficients. You created the interpolant with polyfit. All you need to do from now on to, eval to get values of the density at different temperatures is to just call polyval. So in this case, I want to evaluate the density at the temperature 980. And so I pass 980 to polyval with the coefs. And so if you do that, 
what you're going to get is, okay, let me delete this one. What you're going to get is, let's print it. You're going to get a negative value for the density. Did you get that? Yes, like, not even if that is like, <laughs> vacuum is like zero, right? So, so it is absolutely unphysical. So if you got a negative value, that's a good thing um, that it's working as it's supposed to, but it's a bad thing because something, something is up in this situation. So what is going on? The interpolation messed something up, but we know that the interpolation passes through each and every point. And indeed, if we pass the original data points to polyval, it's going to return to us the original values of the density. And you can check that by plotting. So if we go and plt.plot and we do what was the original data, it was t and rho. Okay, so if we go and do um, plt.plot um, t for the x-axis and rho for the y-axis, and those are going to be um, let's do them um, black squares. Okay, so those are the original data points. Okay, so now I'm going to pass the same temperature T values, but I'm going to put them in polyval. Okay, go Fs and T. So what this is doing is returning to me, it's passing the original input data values through the poly polynomial fit, and it should return the same exact values as the original data set because by definition, the interpolation passes through the original data set. So the points I'm going to plot now in red um, circles, they're going to fall right on top of the black squares, right? If you see that, right on top. And that's exactly what, we, what you hope to expect because the polynomial, by definition, passes through the input data set. However, we don't know what's happening in between those data points. In a linear, when we did an interpolation to a straight line, we had a straight line between the data points. With a high order polynomial, we don't know. So let's go ahead and try to see that. So what I'm going to create next is a linear space between the first temperature and the last temperature. I'm going to pick arbitrary points in between all of those values so I can investigate and see what's happening in between the input data points. So I'm going to do um, T continuous, let's say, or, or TA, let's call it MP.lint space. And we'll do what Emily suggested last time. We're going to go from T0 to T minus 1. We're going to put 100 points in between. And then we're going to do plt.plot. We're going to plot um, the polyval or the interpolant evaluated at all of those intermediate points, OK? So again, coefs, and we'll give it TA. And I'm going to make this a, um, we're going to do it a blue and dash dot. Look what happens. See what's happening here? In between those last three data points, the polynomial goes up, and then it goes through this point, and then goes down, and then it has to come back to that other point. No, it has nothing to do with round off. Because polynomials have roots. An 18 degree polynomial has 18 roots in it. And it's always trying to cross the x-axis. It crosses the x-axis, gets to a root, but then it has to go back to where we tried to pin it down. Okay? So that's the problem with these high-order interpolant polynomials. We, yes, it was good that we fit the entire data set. We don't have to worry about just finding two points and interpolating only between two points. We just have one interpolant for the entire data set, one function that represents the whole thing. But it's a horrible horrible representation. At least in this case. Now, if your function behaves this way, great. But if it doesn't, like in this case, that's absolutely unphysical. And that's the problem with high order polynomials, is that they become oscillatory near the edges of the data set. Okay? I would never use a polynomial of order more than three. 
The problem with that is that you are limited to only doing interpolation with three data points at a time. Okay? We'll see how we can um, work through that in a minute. Okay? All right. So polynomial interpolants can be oscillatory, and they are generally oscillatory. Um, instead, you apply a low-order polynomial locally. Okay? So what that means is you want to interpolate between 400 and 450, let's say. You pick those two data points, for example, do a linear interpolation or do a polynomial interpolation, a quadratic at those three data points or a cubic at those um, four data points. Okay? But then that's very annoying programmatically because you would have to find the, da the closest data points to where you want to interpolate becomes a programming nightmare. But this is the best method to do polynomial interpolation for large data sets is you go two or three or four data points maximum at a time. Luckily, there is a way to do that that is also built in in Python, and that is called cubic splines. And the idea of cubic splines is to do exactly that. Okay, now, we, interest, we, we remember with cubics, you had four coefficients, a0, a1, a2, and a3, right? So you need four data points if you want to put directly a straight polynomial and pass it through. But the idea of cubic lines is that we're going to still do a cubic, okay? but we're going to put it between two data points. And then how, do you, you know, how can you fit the four, how do, can you find the equations for the, four other, for the two remaining coefficients with only two data points and four unknowns, is you start trying to fit the deriv first derivative and the second derivative of the polynomial. And this is what cubic splines do. I'll give an example here with four data points. But the idea is to weave cubics each pair, at each pair of, of data points at a time. So in the first pair of data points, you put the first cubic, which is F1, I call it here, in pink or red. A1x cubed plus B1x squared plus C1x plus D1. A1, B1, C1, and D1 are unknowns. Then you put another cubic. Notice the change in color. This is turquoise color. And then you have new coefficients, a2, b2, c2, and d2. And then you put another cubic okay, between the last two data points. Okay? So here we have four data points. We needed three splines, three cubic splines. In general, for n plus 1 points, you can fit n splines. So for 100 data points, you can put 99 splines. Okay? Because you're taking each pair of points at a time. All right. Now we must specify four variables per spline, right? Those are the a1, a1, b1, c1, and d1, or a, b, c, and d coefficients, right? I'm trying to count the unknowns here. So if you need, if you can put n splines and four variables per spline, so you need four n equations. We need to come up with four n linear equations so we can solve for those four n unknowns. And here's how you do it. First, at each data point on the interior, okay, you pass the spline. So f1 at x2 equal y2, but that's equal to all, that's also equal to f2 at x2. Okay? And the same thing at that point. f2 at x3 is equal to f3 at x3. Okay? So if you do that, at n minus 1 inter interior points, you get 2 times n minus 1 constraints. Okay? We still need more. Then at each point, the first derivative of adjacent splines must be equal. So f1 prime at x2 needs to be equal to f2 prime at x2, and f2 prime at x3 needs to be equal to f3 prime at x3. Okay, so that gives you an n minus 1 constraint. Same thing with the second derivative. So we're matching the value of the function, it's the value of the first derivative, and the value of the second derivative. Okay? So you do the same thing with, this, with the second derivative. That gives you n minus 1 constraints. So we still need two more constraints. And those two come from fixing, uh, we still need four more constraints. So fixing the first and last points, we know the values for those. And then finally, you fix the second derivative at the first and last data points. Okay? Now, this thing we do not know are the second derivatives at the first and last points. Typically, we just set that to zero. Okay? This is all you need to know about splines. I'm not going to ask you to go and write code for splines. It's tremendously annoying. Okay? 
but you need to understand how they're built. So if I ask you on the homework or in the exam, list the conditions to build a spline, you need to be able to do that. Okay, so I give you a specific example over here with those four data points. Um, so F1 at X1 is equal Y1, and F1 at X2 is equal to Y2, F2 at X2, Y2, F2 at X3, Y3, and so on. Next, you match the derivatives at the interior points, and then you match the second derivatives, and finally, you fix the, um, uh, the second derivatives at the ends, okay? So that gives you all the constraints that are needed for this case. Splines are very powerful. Yes? Uh, guys, do you mind? Yes. Um, on the third equation, oh yeah, it's D3. Thank you for catching that. Okay. That's a very good catch. Okay, let me fix it. Thank you. If you find typos as you are studying, there's a tremendous number of equations, okay? So if you find a typo, please let me know and I will update the slides immediately, okay? So thank you for catching that. Miles, you had a question? Yeah, so the um, constraint, the word constraint is just like an equation. Yes, yeah, you just evaluate, so exactly. So you take F1, which is A1 X cubed plus B1 X squared, et cetera. So F1 equal Y1, that gives you one equation, right? Evaluate it at X1. Right? Same thing, and with the second derivatives, it's just the second derivative of F2, F3, the first derivative, same thing. You apply them at those values, you set them equal, so that gives you just a system of equations and all the A's, B's, C's, and D's, okay? You get a large system of equations, okay? As many points as you have, okay? The great part about it is they're not gonna be oscillatory like the higher order polynomials, okay? It does provide, it is one of the best things that you could do um, when doing interpolation, okay? When you're doing drawings in um, Adobe Illustrator and you're kind of moving curves around, what it's doing is doing, trying to put splines between two points as you move the points around, okay? Um, so interpolations are, uh, splines are very useful, but they require a bit more work to implement. We're not gonna implement them. We are gonna use Python, okay? So scipy.interpolate, um, provides some routines for cubic splines. So you call from scipy.interpolate, you import cubic spline, okay? That's the module you need to import. Now the interesting thing, the way you call this, just like polyval, polyfit and polyval, okay? First you call cubic spline with your input data, xi and yi. So xi are the independent variable, yi are the dependent variable, your response variable. You call cubic spline it, and you store that object in a variable, I call it CS here. What does that contain? It contains a bunch of internal information that tells Python how that cubic spline is gonna be interpreted and used, okay? Then, to evaluate an interpolation at some value, you just call CS at that value. That value could be a single value or an array, okay? So CS at XE gives you your value YE like we've used um, before. So let's go back to our um, notebook. Okay, let's go back to our notebook. All right. So now with cubic splines, I'm gonna import um, cubic spline from interpolate. Then I'm gonna call it on the data temperature and density. Remember our so cubic spline in the first argument takes the independent variable, xi, and in the second argument takes yi, the y data, the response data. So in our case, our temperature was the x data, right? And the density was the y data. You do that, it just creates something. If you wanna print it, it just returns some object. Not even coefficients, it's more complicated than just coefficients. Because it's a collection of splines. It tells you here, this is a scipy, don't interpolate cubic spline object, whatever. Scipy knows how to read that, okay? Next, to evaluate the density at 412 and 415, for example, um, or whatever, you just either call CS at 412 and 415, and it gives you the densities at those, okay? 
Now the question is, what happens at 980? Remember, 980 was problematic, right? I'm going to call now CS at 980, and it gives me a reasonable value of 0 0.35 kilograms per cubic meter. Okay? Then I do the same thing here. Look how beautiful the spline is. Okay? It doesn't oscillate between the points. Creates a nice cubic between every pair of points. It's not a straight line. It's a cubic between every two data points. however many data points you need, right? So you could put it with 1,000 data points or 50 data points or 10 data points, but it takes each two pair of points at a time and puts a cubic in between. And it, the way it does that, it forces, it, it forces the first derivative and the second derivative to be equal between these different splines. So between these two points, there's one spline. Between these two points, there's a cubic. Between these two points, there's a cubic. It's not, it's a collection, yep, of piecewise connected lines. It is every pair of data points to make a curve, yeah, a cubic, okay? Very powerful. So I would always use splines, okay? Always use splines. All right. Okay, so the next, we're almost done, um, and I'm going to introduce a bunch of concepts today, also as we get ready for regression analysis. Um, what comes here for 2D, 2D linear inter interpolation is more of a um, next, what happens with higher dimensions, okay? More of for your information, okay? Um, and the only question I might ask you about this is conceptual rather than, um, or just using the code rather than actually doing a, the full derivation because it's pretty complicated. Um, but oftentimes, you have data that is two-dimensional, three-dimensional, or even n-dimensional, okay? And you can apply the same concepts for interpolation in higher dimensions. They're just more complicated to visualize. Instead of straight lines, you'll be fitting in planes and other curves. It gets quite complicated very fast. So here's an example, for, for instance, where temperature and pressure um, giving us the specific volume, which is the um, inverse of the density of water at different pressures and temperatures, okay? And sometimes, you know, you want to interpolate, you want to find an interpolation at some intermediate point, okay? So what do you do? Do you just take the average of those four points? What if that average, um, what if those points were not right in the middle, right, of those four data points? So you need to do an interpolation like we did, um, like we did with the uh, 1D. The idea is simple. If you have four data points and you want to find the value anywhere in between those four data points, okay, you can go at this in two ways. First, you interpolate, for example, in the y direction. You interpolate those two values using standard 1D interpolation. You interpolate to that value of y and that value of y, and then you combine those yellow points and do an interpolation in the x direction. So you have one, two 1D interpolations, and then another 1D in that direction. Or you could do it the other way around. You interpolate in x first, and then in y. They both give you the same answer, and that's the formula. Very quickly, it gets quite complicated. Okay, very quickly. That's linear interpolation. Luckily, linear interpolation in 2D. Fortunately, in Python, we have a 2D interpolant that is similar to interp, but it's called interp 2D, okay? And I'm showing you this here, and I'll give you a notebook for you to try at home and know how, how to use it. You'll use it in heat transfer when you hit your class on heat transfer. It'll be very useful. Um, from scipy.interpolate, you, in, you import interp 2D. As the name designates, it's a 2D interpolation. Now, with interp2d, you also need to do it in two steps. You first create the interpolant and then evaluate it. But in this case, this interpolant takes three basic arguments, x and y data, and then the response data. So I'm going to call those x, y, and z. So in this case, x, i, and y, i are your independent variable, in the variables. In the example I give, those would be the pressure and the temperature. And z, i would be the specific volume or the density. Okay. 
Now, the third, there's a fourth argument called method. What I showed you previously was just a linear interpolation, but you can also do cubic splines or quintic and other higher order interpolations. Okay, so that is um, up to you to use. They will all, they all work within the same concept, the same idea, okay? Just in 2D becomes more complicated. So here's an example that I took from uh, one of the textbooks I use um, for, for this course, the Chopra textbook. Um, you are given temperatures versus X and Y, which is location, and you're given these temperatures on a heated plate, okay? With clearly, you know, apparently with your thermocouples or whatever infrared measurement, you only were able to take five measurements in each direction for a total of 25 measurements on that plate. And that's a lot of measurements, okay? With this kind of interpolation, you can turn this pixelated figure into something that is this nice and smooth, okay? And this is just using linear interp. Now, this, all of this code is in this notebook, okay? Just download, it's not with gaps, so it has all the code written in it. So you can download it and just use it and play with it. You might need it in your heat transfer class um, to produce beautiful reports for um, your teacher. And so they'll be happy to see that, okay? Um, now that's the idea with 2D interpolation. And again, you kind of call it, um, call if you want the temperature somewhere over here or somewhere over here or somewhere over there, you just call it and give it the two independent variable values and it will give you that value, okay? Now what is more important to me beyond this is to start setting the stage for regression, okay? And I added this chapter this year uh, I usually cover this in regression, but I think it is better to cover it um, in this chapter as we get ready for regression. Um, so recall that an interpolating function, so far we covered only polynomials, like cubic, quadratic, um, fourth order, whatever, okay? They, by definition, they must pass through each and every point of the input data. That is, at a minimum, that's a requirement, okay? They need to go through each data point in the data set. And so far, we used polynomials to represent the variation, to represent the variation between, um, I don't know what happened here, okay, to represent the variation between data points. Okay, so think about it. We are trying to anchor a function at those data points that were given. Imagine you're putting a cord around a bunch of pins, okay? You can, imagine you can also adjust that cord in between the data pins, okay? And so, and so far what we've done, we've only assumed that what's happening between the data pins is a polynomial, something of a polynomial nature. But what if you have a little more knowledge about how your data varies, okay? Looking at something that is cyclical, for example, you can say, well, you know, it's not going to behave really like a polynomial or a straight line. Probably it's going to behave more like sinusoidal or a combination of signs and logarithms or exponentials, for example. I'll give you an example. What if your model between the data looks like a cosine and a log, just for the sake of the argument? Okay. Would you be able? to do linear interpolation. I mean, clearly cosine and log are highly nonlinear functions, okay? But do you think we can fit a polynomial or a, this function just linearly? Let's try. So go ahead now and I'm gonna give you two data points, x1, y1, x2, y2. This model has two unknowns, a and b, okay? And I want you to try to fit this model to interpolate the data between those two points, x1, y1, and x2, y2. So put the two data points, okay, and try to fit this interpolant between those two data points. Remember that an interpolant must pass through each and every data point. That was the basis that we used to derive the governing equations of the coefficients. We made the polynomial pace pass through point one, through point two, through point three, right? So we have two unknowns here, A and B. So 
So all we need are two data points, right? So go ahead, derive those equations that govern A and B, and tell me if that system of equations is linear. That is the important question that I'm asking here. By hand, by hand, theory, theory, no Python. Yeah, you're doing it. You're doing it. Yeah. I thought I was okay. doing it wrong for a second. Okay. Yep. There you go. You got it. It is not a Python activity. Yep. Now put it in matrix form. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So that's why, so, so in principle, that's what I would call linear interpolation because the coefficients are all linear, right? It's not, yeah, it's not interpolation to a straight line. So there's a technical difference there, but it is linear. All of it is linear interpolation. Try to pass this model through the two data points and see what you get. Just evaluate that model at each one of those data points. Ampersand. All right, so what do we got? What do you think? Are we going to get a linear system of equations for A and B? Yes. You changed your mind? Yeah, you're saying yes or no? Yes, yes, yes. Why? What left said last time? <laughs> A and B, they show up linearly, right? Okay. All right, so if you... If you don't know how to do this yet, you have to know how to do this. From all the exercises and the, the, the experiments we did earlier in this chapter, this is just simply a formula for a model. All I care about is pass this model through each and every data point that I have. If I apply this model at point x1, by definition, it needs to give me back y1. So I plug in x1 instead of x and y1 on the right-hand side. So I get my first equation. And my second equation is when the model passes through x2, y2. By definition, if it passes through x2, it must be, its value must be y2. What are the unknowns? They're shown in red. They're a and b, and they show up linearly, guys, right? So yeah, this is a linear system of equations for my unknowns. Okay? For all practical purposes, we are f doing an interpolation with a nonlinear function, but the interpolation itself results in a linear system of equations, okay? It still results in a linear system of equations. Despite the fact that the functions are nonlinear, cosine and log. Same thing with the polynomials, x squared and x cubed, those are nonlinear functions. But the interpolation, the governing equations for the coefficients are linear, okay? Okay, now, the punchline here is you don't have to use x, x squared, x cubed, and x to the n. You can use sines and cosines and logs and exponentials and hyperbolic tangents and whatever. Okay? Those are called basis functions. Okay? I use this example to introduce us to the idea of basis functions. The functions you see here our basis functions, what we call basis functions, they are very simple elementary functions that you know, all of the transcendental functions that you know. If you combine them together, when you combine them together, you can create more complicated functions, right? So any combination of those basis functions, you can define whatever interpolant you want. Agreed? Yeah, so if you look at this, these are the basis functions and those are the coefficients. What we have here is a linear combination of nonlinear basis functions. When you evaluate it at your input data points, it will result in this case in a linear system of equations because the parameters 
that you are trying to find the coefficients show up linearly. This can be generalized to any sort of thing. Okay, so now on the left, I have a bunch of models for you to try to figure out what the basis functions are. I'll give you the first basis function set for the first model, a plus bx. The basis functions for that first model are 1 and x, right? Because it's a times 1 plus b times x, okay? So now list the basis functions for the other models. Yes? Yeah, I key, I, on purpose, I changed the nomenclature and I changed just to, yeah, to, to uh, fix that idea that you can call them whatever you want, okay? As long as you are clear what are the parameters and what are the independent and dependent variables. So in this model, the, the independent variables are X and T, okay? All the other things, the A and B and C and are parameters or the coefficients, okay? Just list the basis functions. Huh? All right, so let's see. For the second model, A0 plus A1x plus A2x cubed, what is the basis functions? What are the basis functions? Okay, Miles said 1x and x cubed. That is correct. Okay, what about the other one? A0 plus A1x plus A2e to the minus x squared. Basis functions? Connor? 1x and e to the negative x squared. Correct. All right, what about a plus b log x? Rachel? Thank you. And lastly, a cosine t plus b log t. Ethan? Correct. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Now, in general, you can combine those elementary functions that can be highly nonlinear. You can combine them linearly with each other. You can put however many you want. Okay. Like I'm showing here, if phi 1 and phi 2 and phi 3 and phi m are all basis functions, and you combine them linearly in this way, then you can interpolate this general model through m data points. Why m data points? Because I have m unknowns, m coefficients showing up in red there, okay? m coefficients showing up in red, a1 through a m. So if you have m data points, then you can fit this model through those points. Again, you pass it through the first point, okay, a1, phi1 at x1, et cetera, through x1, that's equal y1. And then you can pass it through x2, and that will be equal to y2. And you can pass it through xm, and that will be equal to ym. Now you see a linear system of equations emerges, okay, your unknowns are A1, A2 through AM, okay? And you convert that to matrix form, this is what you get. A general formula for finding the coefficients of an arbitrary interpolant model with basis functions, arbitrary basis functions that are combined linearly, okay? There's still a footnote here that those basis functions, this model, I'm putting the basis functions and I'm just multiplying them by a coefficient. So the, it's a linear combination of the basis functions. There's no coefficient inside the parentheses of the basis function. Okay, we'll see that in a minute. But in this case, this is just a general recipe for doing interpolation with any function, any model you create. The bottleneck is that you need as many data points as there are basis functions, and that is going to be prohibitively annoying and complicated, okay? Because usually you have two or three data points or, you know, you have 50 data points, but you only have sine and cosine, for example. What do you do? Put 50 cosines in that function? Yes. <laughs> and so 
then that becomes a Fourier series, right? <laughs> okay. So the way to think about this matrix is that the columns correspond to the basis functions. The first column is the first basis function. The second column contains the second basis function all the way to the mth basis function. And the rows correspond to which data point you're at. Notice on the first row, it's all x1. So that's the first data point. Evalu eva those functions are evaluated at the first data point. The second data point is the second row, and so on all the way to the mth data point. Okay? That's a general recipe. We rarely use this. Okay? We rarely use this. Why the heck am I presenting it? Because I'm setting the stage for regression. You will see that with regression, we're going to have a thousand data points. We're going to fit a function with only two unknowns. We're going to have more data than there are unknowns. Okay? So that's the beauty of regression, is that you don't have to have 50 basis functions to fit 50 data points. Okay? You can only have two, data, two basis functions and fit 100 unknowns. Okay? Now how about this model? Alpha, tan, H, beta, X. The, there are two unknowns, alpha and beta, right? Okay. And again, if you were to put an interpolant, that model by definition has to go through each and every data point. Okay? So go ahead, I'm giving you two data points, x1, y1, x2, y2. Find the equations that govern alpha and beta. What equations do I need to solve to find alpha and beta? And tell me if they are linear or not. Hyperbolic tangent. It's a special function um, based on exponentials, et cetera. So. Do the same thing you did before. Apply that model at x1, y1, and x2, y2. Tan h. It's a highly nonlinear function. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. How do we get the beta into the. It's a parameter, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now you need one more equation, right? Because you have two unknowns. What do you think? Okay, so, so now, what do you do? Write it in a residual form. Exactly, we're going back to nonlinear solvers. Yes. Yeah, you can't. <laughs> That's why we teach them at the beginning. No, I'll email you. I, 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 yeah, I found a better room. Yeah, yeah. No peeking at the slides. <laughs> All right. I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what do you think what did you get? Did you get two equations with two unknowns? Yeah? You got two equations with two unknowns, I hope. What can you tell about those equations? Connor? Okay, well, in the linear case, they are also dependent on each other, right? So the A's and B's, they are dependent on each other. However, in this case, more particularly, the unknowns show up in a nonlinear fashion, okay? 
Did you see that when you derived this? Okay, so let's try to do it together. The model function, again, must pass through each and every point. We have two unknowns, alpha and beta, and we have two data points given to us. So at x1, if you apply the model, that's equal to y1, you get alpha tan h beta 1. Tan h is a very nonlinear function based on exponentials. And same thing for y2. Okay. Now, this, is this a linear system of equations? It's not. Because alpha and beta, our variables of interest, they don't show up linearly. They are acted upon by a nonlinear function. Remember our nonlinear solvers discussion? Your variable of interest, if it shows up nonlinearly, or if it's acted upon by a transcendental function, you cannot separate it out. There's no way you can write, if this was beta tan h x1 plus alpha tan h uh, or cosine x2, that's fine. But the fact that beta is inside that tan h, you can't take that out. So this is a system of nonlinear equations. And guess what? We know how to solve this, right? Because we learned that in nonlinear solvers. So linear systems and nonlinear systems, they're going to be with us until the end of the semester. Okay? The, so they don't need to be on exam two because they're going to be part of exam two and exam three, right? Okay? So in this case, you just write these in residual form. And you do what? You use F solve and solve for alpha and beta. Okay? And you know how to do this, I'm hoping. <laughs> you know how to do this, okay? So in general, there is also nonlinear interpolation. Everything we've done so far was linear in the sense that the coefficients showed up in a linear fashion. We did interpolate with nonlinear basis functions, but the coefficients that multiplied those basis functions, they just multiplied them. They showed up in a linear fashion. The equations that govern those coefficients are linear. But you can also develop a model where your basis functions and coefficients show up nonlinear. Yes? About the physics, agreed. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So if you're like taking something cyclical, measuring something cyclical, you'd say, you know, my model looks like alpha cosine x plus beta sine x. Okay. But then you say, oh, this is not a good fit. I need to manipulate the frequency. You say, yeah, you need, I need to introduce one more parameter in the parentheses, alpha cosine omega x plus beta t or something, right? Plus beta. Right. Then you introduce those unknowns more unknowns in your model, and that becomes nonlinear, okay? And that's how you build it in practice, okay? Here, we're just kind of giving you the tools that, yeah, if this shows up, remember to come back to this lecture. Yeah, I've seen this in this class, and we know we have the recipe on how to do it, okay? And you're going to see it. Um, here's a definition. A model interpolant will result in a linear system of equations for the coefficients of the basis functions if those coefficients show up linearly, okay? So here's a table, but I'm going to ask you, for the models that I'm showing here, the parameters or the coefficients are in red, okay? Tell me if that model is going to result, can you tell if that model is going to result in a linear system of equations for the unknowns or a nonlinear one? So again, if the coefficients show up linearly, you can separate them from the basis function, then you're good. Okay? If not,
Or did she call that A? Is the coefficient multiplying the basis function or not? I should number them, right? <laughs> One, two, three. It is not linear. <laughs> okay. Let's start with the first one. Ax plus b. Is that going to result in a linear system for the coefficients? Sure. Okay, I agree. Okay, what about the second one? Ax plus b over x. So basis functions are x and 1 over x. Right? And the coefficients just multiply the basis function. So, yeah, it's a linear combination of the basis functions. Sine AX plus B. Yeah. Couldn't we do inverse sine on both sides of the equation? Inverse sine of sine AX plus B is going to be problematic. Because you, can't sep you cannot do a sum rule on the inverse, right? And even if you do a product rule on sine AX, right, you're still not going to be able to separate it okay, from sine X. So it is a nonlinear model. X to the A plus B, nonlinear. Okay? A to the X plus B, also nonlinear. Okay? A, in those cases, shows up nonlinearly. This guy, what are the basis functions? X and X squared. Oh, he's a constant. <laughs> yeah, E to the alpha. Okay, okay, good. All right, so basis functions are X and X squared. Beta multiplying X squared. Okay, good to go. E to the alpha times X. Well, E is just a constant. 2.78 to the power alpha. You can call all of that A or capital alpha. So you don't have to solve for alpha directly. You solve for e to the alpha, and then you get alpha from that, okay, if you need to. It's a trick, okay? It was a trick. <laughs> this one, nonlinear. Because here, e to the alpha, x, it would be e to the alpha to the power x, right? So it's still a nonlinear uh, model, okay? That's a good exercise. So we're going to see this again in regression, okay? And we're done.